I know when we talk about the hardest MBE questions ever, some of you probably can relate to that video. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe I got to do this. It, it challenges people. So I want to just talk about what we did here, what our methodology was. We have been able over the years to keep huge amounts of data points on questions from every subject to see how many students get each question correct. And what I did is I went through and outside of civil procedure, I picked uh, really 10, the 10 questions with the lowest uh, pass rate, if you will. And then I added a couple of civil procedure questions that out of our civil procedure group had the lowest numbers of answers correct. I will say that all of the questions we're going to be looking at 25% or fewer of the people that took the question in practice got it right. And so you might be thinking to yourself, oh my God, what am I going to do to make this work? But we want to break these down and show you how to work. The other thing we want to say is you don't have to get the hardest questions correct in order to be uh, successful. Right, Megan? Right, exactly. It's a nice thing that this is not the SATs or the LSAT. And so you don't get, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get the, the top score. You just need to get a passing score. Yeah, exactly. And so we're taking the hardest questions because it's interesting to do that. But really, I think that what, I think a couple things. One is you're going to say, hey, these questions weren't quite as hard as I expected them to be. But secondly is knowing that you don't get extra points for getting the top questions correct. I, we could do the 10 easiest MBE questions, and I bet that some of you would over think those and miss those, right? And so I think it's important to keep perspective as we talk about it. Now, what we're going to do is actually go through each question. We're going to invite you to try and answer the question along with us. And Megan, you made a good point. And we're going to start with a, a couple of civil procedure questions. And I think you were talking to me about, well, people say, I haven't studied civil procedure, so how can I do it? What's the response you would give? Yeah, I think so. For anybody here today, who's like, oh no, I'm not going to even guess on these because I, I haven't gone through civil procedure yet. You all graduated law school and I know this, you have learned civil procedure. So trust yourself that this knowledge is in there. It might not be right at the top of your mind, but this is not anything that you've never heard before. So trust your instincts a little bit. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's jump in and see what we got here. What I'm going to do is actually read the question to you and then walk through the process with Megan of how we would respond to, to this particular question. So if you're able to watch on screen, go ahead and read it. If you're uh, listening or later and you're listening on the podcast, here we go. The question says that two ranchers, both citizens of state A, brought an action in a state court in state A against a developer who is a citizen of state B. The ranchers alleged a state law tort claim for water runoff damage to their properties caused by construction on the developer's neighboring property. The first rancher claimed $250,000 in damages and the second rancher claimed 50,000. In their complaint, the ranchers cited federal law regarding the calculation of damages due to water runoff. The developer timely removed the action to federal court. Is removal proper? All right, now, in terms of talking about what the process is, the first thing that I want to say to you is that we're not going to look at the answer choices yet. And for some of you, that'll be stunning, right? You're going to say, wait, I got to know what the answer choices are. But that's exactly where we want to avoid you being distracted on a question like this. Right, Megan? Yes, definitely. This is a maybe feels a little counterintuitive, but once it, I think once you've practiced it and you see how it works, you'll find that it's actually a lot less stressful and confusing. I think so. So let's look at this. And the question, the call of the question is removal proper. So now if you're in the chat box, I want you to, to type into the chat box. The answer to that question is either yes, it's uh, removal is proper or no, it's not. Right? It's a binary choice. And you can pretty much guess on an MBE question that if you get a yes, no kind of question, you're going to have two answer choices typically that say yes, two that say no. Sometimes it's three to one, but often it's a two and two. So what I'd like now is if you're in the chat box, go ahead and type in yes or no and type in the reason that you think yes or no. In other words, just a broad based reason that comes to your mind about why removal would be proper. Now, 
I put up here on the chart one or two reasons, but you, you may not have that. You may not have any, but I just want you to think about it. And again, I want to remind everybody that what we're talking about here is we've got an action in a state court against state A, a developer who's a citizen of state B. The ranchers allege the state law tort claim and the first rancher claimed 250,000 in damages. The second claimed 50,000 and they cited federal law resulting in the calculation of damages due to water runoff, and the developer then removed the action to federal court. So is removal proper, yes or no? Megan, are we getting any answers in the chat box? Yeah, we have a couple yeses. So we've got, you're saying we're getting some uh, some yeses? Got, people are saying yes, because one person satisfied diversity, more than 75K, different state. Yeah. A lot of people saying diversity is proper. There's diversity right. of jurisdiction. There you go. All right, so let's see what we got here. Let's look at the first, the answer choices. And I want to just look at each one. And the goal here is if you've got that in mind, that answer, let's say of yes, because of diversity, hold that in your brain. Let's look at the four answer choices. Answer choice A says no, because the ranchers are not diverse from each other. Pretty straightforward. Let's look at B. No, because the second rancher's claim does not meet the amount in controversy requirement. Okay. Oh, here's a yes. Yes, because the complaint includes a federal question. Okay, remember the question here was, is removal proper? And then D, yes, because the ranchers are diverse from the developer and both ranchers' claims arise from the same facts. For those of you who are playing along with us in the chat box, I want you to look at A, B, C, and D, and I want you to mark which one of those letters you think closely matches up with your predetermined answer. So take a second and let people put that in. And Megan, hopefully we'll see some answers in the chat box. All right. And this process, while people are doing that, this process of previewing an answer is an incredibly effective way because what it does is it allows you to not get distracted by these answer choices, right? It's actually pretty clear when I asked you the question without the answers, but sometimes the answer choices make it more complicated, don't they? Yes, definitely. So we're getting a lot of answer choices. D is in dog. All right, well, let's see if those folks are right. And we, again, the approach here is which answer choice most likely or most closely matches. It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just we got four choices, right? So is it least likely, average, most likely? And I've got the, the thermometer set at 75%. If I can get 75%, I'm really happy. Maybe I'll only get 50%. All right, so now let's see what we got. Let's look at the answer explanations, and we're going to go through each one. If you chose answer A, that is incorrect. And the reason it's incorrect here is that complete diversity is not requ is required between parties who are opposed in interest, but not those aligned in interest. So it, it's important, I think, this is a subtlety in the question, isn't it, Megan? The ranchers are on the same side of the, uh, the case, right? Yes, definitely. So this is one of those ways that I think MBE questions, they try to be tricky. So throwing in that, oh, there's not diversity sort of red herring when really it doesn't matter because the ranchers are on the same side of the, the action. Yeah. And this is where I think people overread, right? They, they read too much into the question and then they start analyzing or hyper analyzing and they get in trouble and they think, oh, well, they're both citizens of state A. So therefore that answer choice that said no, because the ranchers are not diverse from each other doesn't matter, right? They're not diverse from each other, but it doesn't matter because they're on the same side of the, the case. So answer A was incorrect. What about answer B? Well, answer B is also incorrect. And B said no, because the second rancher's claim doesn't meet the amount in controversy requirement. Now, this is one of those things where you've got to, I think if you know the law, it's an easy answer, right? In 2005, there was a, a case, Exxon versus Alapata. And in that case, the Supreme Court said that the second, the second claim qualifies for supplemental jurisdiction because it came out of the same controversy. To my mind, that's a pretty logical thing, right? If we're talking about one controversy, why can't we package one claim on top of the other, right? Would you agree, Megan? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think it makes sense if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, this was one of those cases where I think the Supreme Court finally got around to what logic would tell us, right? Because prior to 2005, you couldn't aggregate your claims for the amount of controversy requirement if you were uh, trying to get diversity jurisdiction. But really, that 
that's not necessary. And this, the Congress passed a rule that changed it in order to make it more obvious. And the court affirmed that. And one of the questions that comes up, people would say, do I need to know 28 U.S.C. 1367? Or do I need to know Exxon versus Alipata? No, of course not. You just have to understand conceptually what's going on here. So if you didn't know this, if you thought for some reason that you couldn't aggregate your claims, this is a good item to put into your notes or your mind maps, right? Yes, I think this is one of those things that if it if that was a new concept to you, you want to make sure that you just jot it down in your mind map, really simple, so that you will remember it for next time. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's see now. We're down to C or D. Oh, answer C. So those of you that got D, I think you're going to be happy. But let's look at answer C. C, remember, said yes, because the complaint includes a federal question. For federal question jurisdiction to exist, the underlying claim has to arise under federal law. But federal question jurisdiction is not simply because federal law was cited. And the federal law in this question was not the law that created the tort claim. So if you jumped on the idea that it was a federal question and that's how jurisdiction exists, you've misread the question because remember it says it's a state law tort claim, right? Don't read facts into the fact pattern that are not there. That is a common mistake that people made, that um, overthinking it and saying, I'm even seeing it. I'm not trying to call you out, Donald, but I see you saying like, C could be right if water treaty was covered in the constitution and that don't go down those roads. Like don't, these are not hypos, right? We don't want to be like, like you're talking to your law professor after class and saying, what if we change the scenario? What if we tweak this? What if that happened? Just take the facts as they've been given to you in the question. And I think that's a good point. This is one of those situations where, and I'd be curious if this uh, student who was talking about that, if they previewed as being yes, because it was federal question. Well, versus... he did a great job. He said, but because I'm not certain, I'll go with my first answer D, which is exactly what Perfect. you want to do. When your mind starts to wander like that and starts yeah. to go down these rabbit trails, you want to reel yourself back in and say, but what was my instinct at first? Go with that. Yeah. So gold star for you, right? Because yeah. you trusted <laughs> yeah. your intuition. So now let's look at answer D. And that was correct. And so congratulations to all of you that got it right. I bet more than 25% of you got it right. So here's why D is correct. We've already seen that the supplemental jurisdiction statute allows jurisdiction over claims that we can go ahead and and combine the the amounts. And it requires that you put the same cases together. They come out of the same case or controversy. In this action, both of the claims arise from the water runoff from the neighboring property. And so they meet the standard of the, the statute. But even if you didn't know, that's still the best answer that's there because the supplemental claim uh, is going to be enough to add on, and it's not going to withhold supplemental jurisdiction. So I think it's really, in some ways, an easier answer if you don't try to get too far, as you said, Megan, down the rabbit trail or into the, the weeds on this, and you just simply keep in mind that the answer that said the ranchers are diverse from the developer, yep, and both ranchers' claims arise from the same facts, yep, those are both true statements, aren't they? And knowing that, then I think you can say, yeah, I could get that. But here's what's really interesting. When people look at the answer choices before they answer, they miss this all the time, don't they? Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that it was about, what did you say, 26% of people got this one correct. On our little study group here today, everyone who answered an answer put down D. And on the previews, I almost every preview was correct what they just assumed. And so I think that very much shows that when you cannot look at the answer choices first, you are, obviously this group did wildly better than 26%. I find that very interesting. The not being able to see the answer choices that will distract you can be very helpful. Yeah. So there you go. Who knew? I knew. All right. So now let's move on. All right. So when you're answering a multi-state question, there are three things I want you to keep in mind that you just saw from this example. The first thing is to try and preview your answer. You saw that if you do that before you look at the answer choices, that is the preferred methodology. Now, as we're gonna see in a minute, you can't always do that. But when you can, when the choice is clear enough to you that you can preview an answer, 
I, I'm going to tell you that, as you saw today in this experiment, people will get the answer right if they can preview it. And why? It's because you're working in your non-conscious larger brain and you're just using your intuition and law. The second thing to keep in mind is that if you can't preview an answer, what you want to do, and we're going to see this in a minute, is to take a quick look uh, at the answer choices themselves uh, so that you have the ability then to start to get some framework. And we're going to do that in just a minute. And then the third thing, most importantly, is trust your intuition. Never try to outthink the question. Don't try to force your way into the question or move through it in a way that's going to be problematic for you. I think when you do that, you're going to find that overall, it's going to be challenging for you to get to what you want. And therefore, it's important to just stay in that intuitive standpoint. Don't yeah, it feels really scary, but I think empirically, it just yields better results. So even though yeah. it doesn't feel like the most confident thing, I think if people, when they try it, they're like, oh, the numbers speak for themselves. Absolutely. Then the next thing is that after you've done the, the question and you've looked at the answer explanations and, and done that, certainly in practice, this is the time to start adding to your mind maps. If you're in bar maps, you've already got a preset uh, mind map. If you're not, you can draw your own or make your own. We use a, a program called MindMeister. I really love that. But whatever way you're doing, this is the time to add to the mind map. And you could see in this question, you might have had to, to raise some information about supplemental jurisdiction. Uh, you might have uh, needed to know uh, a bit more about uh, the diversity rules. And if you're missing something, or even if you're getting it right, but you didn't know exactly why, this is when you go and, and add into your mind map. Yeah, this is like a key piece of the puzzle. I think don't step that don't skip this step, please. And, and when we see people adding to their mind maps and working with their mind maps, this is when we see real success. I know a lot of you are like, oh, I don't have time. I don't want to do it. But trust me, traditional note taking is nowhere near as effective as mind mapping and doing the mind map right after you've answered the question. It's fresh in your mind why you got the answer right or wrong and you've got context for it, right? If I were to just ask you to add information to your jurisdiction mind map about supplemental jurisdiction, I think most of your eyes would glaze over. But if we've just done this question, it makes a lot of sense. Now it's like, oh, okay, I get why I should be talking about that. And that's what helps your brain fix it and locate it when you need it again. So that's really what we're saying is in terms of a structure. And really what we're getting at overall is that selective intuition allows you to use your whole mind and your, your whole brain. It allows you to use not only your gut reaction and your logic and your background, but also everything you've studied. I don't know how many of you studied supplemental jurisdiction before we just did this question, and yet you got the question right, a question that most people get wrong. How did that happen? We locked you off, we forced you to use your intuition, and when we forced you to use your intuition, voila, it, it works for you. So I think it's a really great way to, to prove the point. Now we're gonna make it a little bit harder. I'm not gonna lie. We're going to give you a question that's not quite so direct, although it also only had a 25% correct answer choice. So are we ready for that one, Megan? Yep. Here we go. Question nine on our countdown. A pharmaceutical retailer sued a drug manufacturer in federal court for antitrust and unfair competition violations under federal and state law. After the parties completed discovery, the retailer submitted a pretrial narrative statement designating a broad set of facts and issues to be tried. The manufacturer disputed the statement and submitted a much narrower one. At the final pretrial conference, the court entered its final order, ruling in favor of the retailer's broader statement as the one the court would read to the jury during voir dire and would use to define the facts and issues to be tried. The manufacturer's attorney is concerned that trying many of the facts and issues listed in the pretrial order would reveal litigation strategies important in other actions pending against the manufacturer. Call the question is, what's the best way for the manufacturer's attorney to seek relief from the court's ruling on the pretrial statement? Now, this presents us with a different kind of problem. This is not a yes or no or a binary question, is it? It's an open-ended question. Yes, exactly. There's not a yes, no answer. And because of that, it's now harder to preview an answer, I think, for a lot of people. So what happens here is that in this circumstance, you have to start looking at the answer choices to give you some context, some direction generally. And so 
We're not saying you never look at the answer choices. Here's an example of a time when I think you need to do that, uh, but you don't want to go down the rabbit trail. So let's look at the answer choices that were being given to help us get the parameters of what we're looking at. The first answer choice A says that uh, the best way for the manufacturer's attorney to seek relief from the court's ruling on this pretrial statement is to appeal from the final pretrial order, arguing that it's overbroad on its face. So <clears throat> I've identified here the appeal from the final pretrial order. That's one set of options. Let's see what else we've got. Answer choice B says that what could be done for the manufacturer's attorney is to object in trial court and appeal any adverse ruling on the objection. And again, I've identified objecting in the trial court because that's different than answer choice A. You see where we're going here, Megan, with these two? Yeah, it, it definitely. Different choices right. when you would do, when you would make your objection or appeal. Right. Okay. So now let's look at answer choice C. Object in the trial court. Ah, so we're getting some, some consistency here. Now, I might stop even at that point and say, it looks like part of the the answer is going to be, do we appeal in final pretrial order or object in trial court? That seems to be one. But now answer choice C is giving us the same result, but for a different reason. File a motion to delay the trial. And then finally, answer choice D, oh, it's a three-in-one kind of answer. Object in the trial court and move to modify the order to prevent manifest injustice. So now what I want to do is ask all of you in the chat box, having just seen that, and we've not looked at any of these answer choices in depth, I want you to preview your answer. And I'm going to read the question again. Pharmaceutical retailer sues a drug manufacturer in federal court, antitrust violations under federal and state law. Parties complete discovery. Retailer submits a pretrial narrative statement that designates broad set of facts and issues. The manufacturer disputes the statement, submits a much narrower one. At the final pretrial conference, the court enters its final order, ruling in favor of the retailer's broad statement that's the one the court's going to read uh, to define facts and issues. Manufacturer is concerned that trying many of the facts and issues listed in the pretrial order would reveal their strategies important in other actions pending against manufacturer. And then it asks us which is the best way for manufacturer's attorney uh, to seek relief from the court's ruling. So I think what happens now is that with just that in mind, I would start by saying well, I've got three that start objecting the trial court and one that says appeal from the final pretrial order. So that's the first cut level for me. Is that where you would be? Yes. I would first want to figure out which place I thought was the proper place to make my objection or appeal. And I'm not sure that I would go much further than that in reading the answer choices in order to use my selective intuition. So now what I want you to do, participants, is go into the chat box and tell us A, B, C, or D. And the reason that you think that would be the case, if you can, right? Great. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm not surprised. I think this is a harder one than the first. We're getting a lot yeah. more over the board. So we've got some A's, some D's, a B. So yeah, we're seeing some more. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting to me because this is a harder one to preview, like you said, right? Right. It's a much trickier uh, one. You actually have to go into the questions to be able to, and then you see the potential answers and then your brain starts to play tricks on you a little, right? Like, ooh, yeah. only one is appeal from final pretrial order. Does it make it more likely that that one's wrong because yeah. there's three yeah. of the other or does it make it more likely that it's right? So, yeah. But again, if, if we took just that, if I had said in the fact pattern that the choice would be appeal from the order or object in trial court and why, I think it would have been easier for people to preview it. So what you're doing is if you look at the screen here, I've uh, put into italics what was the same or different, and the rest of it I'm hoping you don't read, okay? <laughs> Fundamentally, that's what I want, is for you to try and preview it. Okay, let's see what happens here as we go through. Uh, which answer most closely matched yours? So let's see where we are again. All right, if you chose answer A, <clears throat> this answer choice, I'm sorry, is incorrect. And the reason that it's incorrect is that an immediate appeal from a final pretrial order is impossible because there was no final judgment in the action. That's really all you need to know. There's more information here, but it's it, you can't preserve it for appeal. And so appealing from that point, uh, you can't really do because we don't have a final judgment in the overall action. And I think everything else really is a distractor, don't you? 
Yeah, exactly. I think it's you want to uh, drill down to the core of the the conflict here is in this case we're testing and with this answer they're testing do you know that there has to be a final judgment in order to appeal <clears throat> exactly so if you chose answer a you're incorrect and i think the reason you're incorrect is just there's no final judgment and everything else is not so important let's keep moving on what about answer b this said object in the trial court and appeal any adverse ruling on the objection this answer is also incorrect and if you make an immediate appeal from any adverse ruling, then it's not possible because, again, there's no final judgment in the action. But more importantly, objecting at the trial court level doesn't preserve the issue for appeal. And so that's it's a weirdly worded answer, isn't it? Right. Objecting the trial court. We now know that's going to be correct, that that particular piece. But to appeal any adverse ruling. You can't do it because, again, you don't have a final judgment in the action. So if you keep it simple, that's a choice you shouldn't select. It should be obvious to you. We don't have a final judgment, so you can't appeal it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's look. Answer C. Oh, okay. Those of you that chose D are happy again, but let's look at answer C. C says object in the trial court and file a motion to delay the trial. If you object, that won't preserve the issue for appeal. And if you do, uh, make a motion to delay the trial, how does that help you modify the final pretrial order? It just doesn't get you where you want to go. This is an answer choice that's not explicit in the, the fact pattern, but it's common sense, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm trying to see if it, I don't think anybody put C down at all. Oh, good. Um, okay, good. I think that yeah. was one. So good job. Like, honestly, because yeah. I think C is the answer that's maybe the most off topic. And so good job Definitely. for recognizing that. Yeah, not, not, not getting distracted. Although I know people get distracted all the time and that then they answer C. All right, well, let's look at why D is correct. Under rule, uh, Federal Civil Procedure Rule 16E, when the trial court issues an order about the trial plan after this final pretrial conference, the order can be modified for only one reason, and that's to prevent manifest injustice. So if you're thinking about what to put in your mind map, that's the piece to put in, wouldn't you think? Exactly, because the key with this one is if you knew, which it's totally fine that you guys are this like, we're very far from the exam, so I don't necessarily expect a lot of people to know this one off the top of their heads. But as you're studying and you know that the requirement or the standard is to prevent manifest injustice, then as soon as you saw that in answer choice D, that's what you're going to narrow. That's your intuition is you're going to know, oh, manifest injustice, that's the key. That's the standard. That's what we have to meet here. Great. Perfect. Mark it and move on. Yeah. All right. So that's. We got through two of them. Next week, we are going to move on. And boy, if you thought these were hard, wait till you get to next week's. <laughs> yeah, I do hope this is helpful for people, regardless of whether you got them right or wrong. I just hope the process of looking at these different kinds of questions, as we go through them, I think it's going to help both in terms of substance, but certainly in terms of the strategy and the approach. And that's really what we wanted to carry away for you. So definitely join us next week. We're going to go through the next two, maybe three questions and but I think it's really helpful also this was great like in community to have you guys showing your process as well so that other students can see what's your thought process why do you think that okay I see that like here's a um, different way maybe that someone's looking at it so hopefully this is helpful Megan thank you and appreciate it and next week we'll come back and take on some more of the 10 hardest MBE questions ever bye bye, -bye.